Daisha Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to MulliganSpharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. Good morning and welcome to the show. Our number, you probably know it by now, it's 083 335. You can text or WhatsApp 083 335. You can call Audrey on 051 846 We've Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure, Pascal Dunne, who's going to be on the programme very shortly. And another minister in the studio, John Halligan. Good morning, John. Good morning, Damien. John is going to be listening to this interview and will be answering some of the questions afterwards in terms of the developments of Waterford and how things are going, and also on a personal level, talking about some personal matters. We're also going to be talking to Bernadette Ryan, our relationship counsellor. What's the point of marriage? Now, there's a question. <laughs> very important, very important question, John. <laughs> Fine Gael voices at the constituency meeting last night. I was down in Dungarvan last night, so we'll be talking. You'll be hearing the likes of John Cummins, Damien Gage, and all the different people talking about all those issues. We also want to know your thoughts about Roy Keane. Was he way over the top when he spoke about John Walters and men crying in public? Should men be allowed to cry? Is it a good thing to do that? We're also going to talk to Jason Ryan, hopefully, and Mary Walsh about the education opportunities in the WWETB. Firstly, as many of you know, Pascal Donoghue was in town yesterday. He's the Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure. He was also down in Dungarvan last night. He oversaw a lot, a lot of meetings with individuals about the bullying allegations and also the possible candidates for Fine Gael for the next general election. We got an interview with Pascal Donoghue in the City Hall, in the Council Chambers, yesterday afternoon. So this was obviously before he went to his meetings last night and before the meeting last night. Uh, He had been making some announcements, or non-announcements as the case may be, regarding the North Keys. So you'll hear this interview. Uh, It's recorded in the Council Chambers. I say there's a little bit of an echo on it. But uh, this is the interview with Pascal Donoghue, Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure. Good morning. Good morning, Damien. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be on. Uh, congratulations on your nomination now for the Imro Awards. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You've been to Waterford this morning. You've been around different places. Uh, what's your perception of, of the city and what you've seen? Uh, my perception is that we are making progress on priorities that I know really matter to citizens and residents here in Waterford City and County. But I'm also crystal clear uh, that there's further progress that we need to make. You know sound bites better than I do um, is this a sound bite visit uh, not at all. In fact, it's the very opposite of, of us. If you look at all of the things that your listeners and viewers know that I'm dealing with at the moment, from Brexit to the budget, the very fact that I'm here for a day is evidence of me actually just looking to make sure I understand. One of the things I'm really aware of as a minister is that while I get briefed continuously on different issues, you really have to make sure you're seeing things yourselves, yourself and hearing from people who are affected by it. So uh, the very fact that I spent a lot of the day, for example, talking to people away from the media, I, though of course very pleased to do this, is all about evidence of me looking to understand and see where I can help. And the reason I say that with the greatest of respect is that you have brought nothing new, you've announced nothing new today. You've said a lot of things that you want to do. There's aspirations there, very worthy aspirations, Mm. but you haven't announced anything new for Waterford today. I guess that's the flip side of your question, though. Um, you've asked me, is this a soundby visit? And equally, I can imagine if I was here making a big announcement about a particular matter, you'd be asking me questions about the intentions behind that as well. The things that we have to deliver for Waterford uh, are so big, they're not the kind of things that you deliver or indeed announce on a single visit. Uh, there will be announcements, there will be decisions that will flow from this, but I'm an awful lot more interested in getting those decisions right than appearing on your show and pretending that we're trying to make progress for the purpose of organising a visit. And with that in mind, specific questions, specific answers. November 2017, the submission went in in terms of a planning framework, and this was involved and integrated to the national planning framework of how the North Keys would become the key enabler for growth in this region. The council have been looking for 105 million over five years approximately. They've got six million. Last year, they looked for 18 million. They haven't got anything this year. 
Why? Uh, because we have a particular uh, uh, kind of work that needs to go on regarding how we can be sure we can meet the transport needs that the local authority have raised in relation to the North Keys project. That work is underway. I've been briefed on it again. I don't need to tell your, your listeners and viewers about some of the issues we have with the train station, with the rail line, and some of the things you correctly want regarding how you can integrate the Greenway and a new and an existing bridge into the project. That's really complex. In terms of when I think we're going to get this work concluded, um, we've made a lot of progress. I think we've a few more months ahead of us and I am confident we will be in a position to deliver more clarity to enable the project to move forward. The first week on my programme in February, I raised this matter, the potential that Inroad Aaron would say that they're not going to pay for the relocation of the train station. Are Inroad Aaron blocking this? They're not blocking us, uh, but Inroad Aaron have a huge number of other projects that they need to manage. And as I'm sure you'll know, the maintenance of rail lines is an incredibly expensive transport poor commitment. So to be specific, they are not blocking us, but they have an array of other needs they're trying to manage, including in the southeast. Okay, so they're not giving the go-ahead for this. Well, look, in road area... Because if they had, you would now be able to say, we can commit this amount of money. So but effectively, they're blocking it. Of course, there's circularity to all of this, though, which is in turn in road air and need more money to be made available to them. So they can say, we can do all of the things we need to do for rail, both in the southeast and beyond. So they are, they are not blocking us. The issues that we have are as much about the design and how things will come together. But yes, funding does play a part in us. But I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to resolve that. There is a pressing need on this because this has been going on now for two years, okay? So these issues were flagged before. Sure. I see the Freedom of Information issues. This is flagged before. So the fact that you're still talking about this and still trying to sort this out, when there's a private company who has said, we will put in 300 million, but if you don't give us the guarantee, by November, they're now saying, two months time, they may well go. The planning, uh, the, the planning permission for this project has needed been granted yet. I understand. So, 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 let's take a step back. Why, why has the plan commission not been put in yet? Because of the complexity of the project and, and, and as Vulcan, as you can appreciate, they have their investors and their funding suppliers they need to manage. Equally, I have commitments and expectations that I need to manage on behalf of our taxpayers. And I, I believe we'll be able to bring both together. And uh, you're right to say this is something that's been going on for two years. In fact, to be honest with you, Damien, I actually got the idea for the Urban Re Regeneration Development Fund I know from a visit that I had yes. here. Because the issue that we had, and it was a big problem two years ago, is actually the scale of this project and the fact that it needs funding across lots of different government departments wasn't actually something we had an easy answer to two years ago. There's a degree of complexity about this that meant we had to look at a new way of funding things like this and we have that underway. Underway. Like again, I go back to the point that if there is a priority given to this, a solution can be found fairly quickly. Is there a possibility that you will not get that solution by November? Uh, I am always very reluctant, as you can appreciate, as Minister for Finance, who I'm here debating and you're correctly questioning me about this here today. But of course, there's hundreds of other projects like this across the country. Uh, so do I believe we will be able to resolve the issues that you're talking about? Yes. Yes, I do. Let's just have a look at it in the context of the fact that we've already made six million euro available to us. And this project is named in Ireland 2040. We wouldn't have done any of these kind of things if we weren't eager to move it forward. I know, but that again, and put it on the long finger, potentially, it is part of the national planning framework. It's the key enabler. It's part of government policy that this is delivered. If you said, and you said a few minutes ago, we'll be ready to go in a few months. There's a possibility you may have missed the train. Uh, and when you are dealing with very large amounts of money and very big projects like this, there is always risk. 
But if I was sitting down here today and the project was not listed in Ireland 2040 and then had received no funding at all, I can imagine we'd be having a very different kind of interview. And maybe in the coming uh, months we can be back here again uh, discussing and reviewing the progress of it, which I believe will have moved forward again. So you cannot confirm today a funding model yet. I never gave an expectation or an indication that I was coming here today to do that. What I said, and this in fairness has been uh, recognised by all of your politicians that I met here today, is I was coming here to get my own sense of where we stand and to ensure that we can get this to the place where we're able to give the clarity that you, your listeners and the local authority and the investors need. Um, what do you think of John DC? I think John DC has been an exceptional public representative on behalf of Fine Gael and Waterford. I've had the opportunity to serve with him for a number of years. I've seen him raise issues on behalf of your city and county with great uh, tenacity and skill. Uh, I've got to say the thing that impressed me the most about him is I was on the Public Accounts Committee with John for a number of years and I thought he was a really good, really, really impressive parliamentarian. He was appointed the government's envoy to the United States, yeah. the largest, most powerful country in the world. He has alleged ongoing bullying and harassment within the Fine Gael party in Watford for years. Is there? Uh, 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 I don't believe that there is uh, and I am here today to not only do the work that we've talked about a moment ago but also to meet members and meet public representatives and directly engage with them. I've been a member of Fine Gael now since I was 19 years of age and across that period, do you know what? Politics is a very tough trade. You know yourself the passions it can raise. I've had lots of tough moments, tough meetings. Bullying is a very difficult subject. Indeed. Have you ever been bullied yourself? Uh, I haven't. Have you ever dealt with bullying cases? Yes, I have. And sometimes the victim may feel that he or she has been bullied and the perception may be that they've been bullied, even though bullying may not be proven. And I think that is a very, very important point, uh, uh, both in the workplace or in socially, not to mention in, in the schoolyard, in all of the different fora of life. Behaviour can happen that, of course, can lead to very different interpretations. But, and here's the boss. If you are a workplace, if you're an employer, if you're an organisation like Fine Gael, uh, we have to take all of these allegations really, really seriously. And both Tom Curran, who's the General Secretary of Fine Gael, and I take very seriously an allegation like this. And I am here today, uh, both this afternoon and tonight, to talk to members about that and other matters, and just to reaffirm the kind of behaviours we believe are really important. You seem to have made up your mind already that you don't think the bullying has gone on? Uh, from engagement that I have had on the matter, uh, uh, it is it appears to me that uh, while behaviours, while views may have been really, really strong, it doesn't, at this point, um, appear to be consistent with bullying. But again, I have work I need to do here, I have meetings that I want to have, and I'll conclude my own views in the matter when I've all that done. Pascal Donahue, thank you very much. Damien, thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that conversation. We are going to be talking to John Halligan, reacting to some of the issues raised on that just after this. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. Now, a number of texts coming in. Very disappointing to see only 10 councillors attending the meeting with Pascal Donoghue yesterday. I really fear for the North Keys after that interview, says Paul. Um, I'll be reading out some texts from different people involved in the projects in the later on in the programme. Uh, Minister... Um, John Halligan, Minister of State for Training, Skills, Innovation and Research and Development. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome, Damien. What is your understanding regarding the North Keys? We've heard what Pascal Donoghue's had to say, that is ongoing discussions with different agencies. I spoke with Inroad Aaron this morning. They say that they have put forward what they've been asked to do and they haven't been asked to do anything else. Okay. There seems to be a lot of confusion. Yeah, there is a bit of confusion. There's no point in saying otherwise. But if you can remember, the developers did meet uh, Leo Varadkar and Pascal O'Donoghue last year. Um, the funding that was under the national plan that was given out 
uh, there, that six million was still the highest to any other area in the country. It was six million. There's no government going to give six million and then abandon the plan. That's not going to happen. I know that to be a fact. Why would they do that? They have chosen Waterford as part of the big investment that they will invest in. Yeah. The difficulty that they have at present is this, that it's substantial investment. Uh, a lot is pre, uh, predicated now on what happens for this budget with Brexit. We're faced, we, we could possibly be facing into catastrophe. And you know this and I know this in the agri se- section and in business section. If there's a crash out in Brexit, the budget will have to be curtailed. Anybody that even the opposition, I haven't met anybody in the doll that normally come along and say we want this and we want that in the budget. Everybody recognises now that money will be tight. But I am convinced, I am convinced the North Keys will not be abandoned by the government. They've already stated we've given six million, the most we've given to any other area of the country. They're not going to just let that six million go and evaporate. They will invest further. But is, as, uh, we'll talk about capital developments in a, in a few minutes in the 2040 plan. It's part of the national development plan that the government has signed up to. Yes. The North Keys is the key enabler for employment growth in the South East, not just in Waterford, OK, for the next few years. The council has looked for 18 million for this year to move things along. Hmm. The, finan- the developers are saying we'll bring, bring in 300 million. Yes. I spoke with some of them last night. There is a possibility that if this shifting of money, like Pascal Donoghue needs to talk to Shane Ross through yourselves and get money shifted over to Inroad Aaron or whatever the case yes. may be. To, to move. So, and it's not going to be taken out of current budget financing because it's part of capital development. So it is possible to do these things. There's just a fear out there. And I know Brexit is there, John, but there's a fear out there that this is not going to happen. Okay. Everybody, every business person yesterday, they were all saying it. Everybody's talking okay. about it. I had the pleasure of Pascal. In, he stayed in my house for a while when he came to Waterford here and I spoke to him specifically on that. The North so he was case. in your house the other night. He was, yes. Having a glass of wine. Having a glass of wine, yes. And sitting down and Red or white. Chapter. White. <laughs> white, white. So, uh, um, like he did say, and I did specifically mention the North Keys, my point with the North Keys to him was this. This isn't only to do with water, but it's to do with the whole of the South East. Yeah. It has ramifications for Kilkenny, Wexford, Clonmel, Tipperary, the whole, wa- the whole, but specifically for Waterford to draw more business, tourists. All of the stats have been given to the government. They know that by investing in this, it's a sure investment. I know that this will happen. There's no question this will happen. As I said... But it may not. Again, just listen to what Pascal had to say in a few months' time. This urgency that has been required by the business people and by the developers doesn't seem to be registering with certain maybe general secretaries of departments with different people. Okay. With the, the, this and, uh, that's, a very, that's a very good question. I spoke to Shane Ross on this and I spoke to Shane Ross's department and uh, like I'm already in a war with them over the airport because the, that, uh, the, the, there was a wicked battle and bad meetings took place there because of the getting the fund and they said I shouldn't have been given. And I'm back in with that department again speaking to Shane Ross. I would say this and I'm convinced of this. There's no question about this. Again, the government... Uh, um, Leo Varadkar himself specifically mentioned the North Keys as one of the big projects that must be supported. Well, heads would have to be knocked together. And heads will be knocked together in the next couple of months. I give you my word on that. But Again, I would say... To we're you, now September. The developers yes. are saying if this is not... Like, we're talking planning permissions, we're talking about stuff, not November. This could happen. This could be gone. Okay. They could be gone. What I would say is this, that I remember speaking to the city manager on this and uh, he himself, I think he was on your programme, he was comfortable that the biggest investment in all of Ireland Ireland had been given to Waterford. He was comfortable with the fact and he met Pascal O'Donoghue and he had a few words with the Taoiseach. And if you look at where the money was given in that particular plan, the biggest bunch of money was given to Waterford. And again, I know I'm, I'm talking over myself saying this, but they have said, John, we're not, we wouldn't give six money, six million euro, and then that to be washed down the drain. We'd be murdered. That's not going to happen. Substantial money would be given to the North Keys. I know that to be true. There are negotiations, tentative negotiations going on. It is a bit more complicated dealing with uh, the Department of Transport and other departments that y- you have to get the money from. So I think that, um, and I spoke to Pascal on this, I spoke to Leah for for Radker in this. Um, I'm convinced that the North Keys will not be abandoned by the government. Will you be here to cut the ribbon on the North Keys? Uh, They'll want the senior minister doing that. (laughs) 
I think <laughs> I'd say uh, and the reason because uh, it's very important to talk about the combination of personal and political okay so Elaine, your good wife, is unfortunately unwell at the minute. Yeah, she's had a tough two years, as you know. You you know Elaine well. Um, she's had a tough two years in and out of hospital and so on. And uh, she's been in and out she's of three hospitals. She's had problems and, and different issues. Yeah, she, she's had all sort of some complicated problems that we're working through at present. So uh, it's trying to manage that. Uh, uh, Elaine is my first priority, uh, as you know, and it has been difficult. But look, uh, she's British and she's strong. So, like, she makes the point that, look, there are people worse and we've been in places like the Beacon Clinic and Waterford here. Who, and I just want to, uh, she'd be going out to the hospital today to see a specialist. Uh, I think the work they do in that hospital is absolutely fantastic. She's under two consultants who are absolutely University wonderful. Hospital Waterford, Yes, is it? they're wonderful. And, uh, so you're doing like, the combination of here yeah, and, so, and the yeah, Beacon so Clinic. So when she was pretty bad... Uh, they brought her back together out there. They're absolutely fantastic. So I just wanted to make that up. And we want to wish her the very best. And uh, I know her. I want to wish the very best. And oh, I appreciate that. We're going to have her in with yourself, hopefully. Yes, in, yeah. In, yeah, in, yeah, that in, would be in interesting. some weeks to come. And that's one of the reasons that we can't um, extend this interview too long, because I know you want to be out with her in a yes, few yeah, minutes. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go through some other issues in a few weeks' time. Um, how difficult is it for you as a, a politician, as a public representative, to balance caring for a loved one? and your requirements as Well, I suppose I'm no worse than anybody else or no better. Like, I mean, I know politicians in different parties who have four kids, five kids. Uh, they're travelling from around the country. Um, they're trying to balance their own work life uh, as a politician coming to the Dáil three or four days a week uh, and then balance their personal life with their wives, their lovers, their boyfriends, girlfriends, or their families. So, like, I'm not special in this. I'm not special at all in this. I meet politicians every day of the week um, like ministers, for instance, like Jesus. I mean, I see, I, like, I've got about two weeks' holidays this year in the summer because of school transport. I've had to go to Russia because of Brexit. I've been to Italy because of Brexit. Uh, I've been to Brussels on a number of occasions. I do the negotiations for the government in Horizon 2020. But, like, I see senior ministers have just given up now. They're seven days a week uh, just in Dublin. They don't move out of Dublin at all. They barely get home. Simon Coveney. Uh, I was speaking to Simon Coveney yesterday. I was at, I was delighted to be at a cabinet meeting yesterday, the day before yesterday. Simon hasn't been home. He'd done an interview from Cork last night on prime time and he was flying back out to Brussels again. I mean, like, you know, give some recognition, not to me, not to me, but to all politicians from all parties who I think work very hard uh, to do their best. They're not all great at doing it. And some people may say, you're not good at doing it. That's fine. But I don't know of any politician. I, 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 uh, I was talking to David Cullinan yesterday. We were handling a particular complicated case between the two offices. We sorted it out between us. There's no animosity. He works hard. Puddy Coffee works hard. Um, um, uh, Mary Butler, they work hard. And in spite of the criticism that we get from the media sometimes. like You didn't we, mention John Deasy there. Uh, John, no, John, like, I mean... I, I, I don't want to go into what's going on in Fine Gael, but I will say this, and I'm going to say this. Um, John was a good friend of mine. When I was a councillor, John D.C. was very good to me. So I'm not going to criticise him. Uh, whatever happened personally or whatever with Fine Gael is his own business. But I think we should remember this. He gave long service to the people of Waterford. Should he have come back? Should he have come in and done interviews with you? I think he should have. And I think you would have been fair and balanced as you are with all politicians. You would have been tough, which you have to be, and you should be. And I had said that to him. I think he should have done that. I think he shouldn't abandoned. He shouldn't have abandoned WLR. WLR are good for Waterford and good to the politicians in Waterford. But he did give good service to Waterford, and that should not be washed over. Has your relationship with Elaine and your caring for her and your love for her coloured your ideas of the next election? Look, the next election I don't think will take place until next year because of Brexit, because of what, what's happening in England. There will be an election in England first and then even at that stage we won't know if England are crashing out or what they're doing. Are they going out in October? Will they get uh, an extension? And um, I think that uh, all of us have to stay put here now uh, to do our job for the country. Uh, all of us are being farmed out across the world to meet other politicians. I've been as far as Japan, Russia, uh, Colombia, 
uh, to uh, promote Ireland and promote our agriculture and promote other markets. And we, I, I, I have to put, I have to balance with putting my family first and putting the country first over the next number of months. And where if I change my you? mind or anything, I, I, uh, Damien Tiernan will be the first to know. And where is that leading you, though? It's leading me what into I, I, the, the thought. It's leading me into is that, like, I'm in politics thirty years. Um, I've been honoured to uh, be a councillor three times. I've been honoured to be, I think it was Lord Mayor we were called at the time. I've been honoured to be elected twice and I've been honoured to be a minister. And I love the job. I like politics. We're handling about 150 cases. Uh, I was up in the office before I came into you, a week in the office, like many other politicians. And you always get good satisfaction when you get something over the line for somebody. I think I'm doing a good job for Ireland. Actually, I think I'm doing a good job for Waterford. So... I'll have to, like, I think, you know, I'm not the only politician thinking about this come next election. You have to kind of weigh up what will you do? Will you stand? Will you not stand? I'll be 65 in January. I could quite easily go out and get a reasonable pension. Won't get a full pension. Not expecting it. Don't want it. I'm OK. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll think it out very carefully. Um, you know, you have to remember. So you're, you're, I, you're, you're considering not running. I am not considering anything at present, to be honest with you. I'm just Phoenix, working through everything. The Phoenix magazine, the national magazine published there just yesterday, it says that six months ago you told people that you, you weren't going to run. I was in a kind of a difficult position six months ago because Elaine was in hospital and she wasn't well. And it was tough. She'd been in and out of hospital, you know, for months and months on end. And uh, it was a bit traumatic for me. Uh, um, and the family, of course. So, And I don't like talking about her over the air now, but like that, that could, there's, you know, you have to think, you, you have to think of your friends and your family first. But as against that, then I have a lot of people working for me full time and part time. Like, if I resigned as a minister, they would all lose their jobs. You're talking about one, two, three, four, five, about seven or eight people if, if from Waterford here alone, you know, who have families. And like, I have to think about them as well, because they've been very good and very loyal to me. So at the minute, the John Halligan will be on the ticket. The minute John Halligan will be on the ticket. But if that changes... Damien Tiernell will be the first to know if I'm not going to do it. And that would be a combination of, as you say, personal... Personal and, and tiredness, to be honest with you. Um, I it's think a big thing to, to, if you did get elected, to stay into it for another five years if you're you going see, to... see, I probably wouldn't be a minister again. You probably would be in, I'd be in opposition. And to be honest with you, I would find... And I'm, people might not like me saying this now. Uh, Fine Gael, I think, have been good to me and I think they've been pretty progressive. Uh, so have members of Fianna Fáil and I get on, I've never been criticised in the doll by even the, the left who should be coming after me because I'm in government with Fine Gael. And ah, there's, would, some, there's some people now who are criticised and there's a lot of texts coming well, in, yeah, a lot but, of texts wishing you well as well. Yeah, I, I, I would be a hypocrite if I went back on the back benches and then started attacking Pascal O'Donoghue and st- attacking... Leo Varadkar. Others might be able to do it. I would find it hard to do that. But having said that, um, I'll weigh up my options with the people of Waterford, the people I work for, and uh, my own family. I'll make a decision um, and I'll tell the people of Waterford. When will you make that decision? I'll make it. uh, It's it's very hard to know, Damien. We don't know what's happening with November, maybe. Maybe November. If I come into you in November, if if, if I'm ringing you in November and say I want to come in and talk to you urgently. I might have a decision made one way or the other and I'll be telling you. Um, more than likely that will mean that you will be running again unless we hear differently. Yes, yes. Um, do you get, like you've mentioned having wine with Pascal and mentioned going abroad and mentioned meeting the politicians and, and, and do you get mesmerised in any way by the bright lights of big politics? No, I'll tell you what I, what I am mesmerised by. I, how well thought of Ireland is around the world. It's unbelievable. The respect we have in places like Russia, Japan, Korea that you wouldn't even think of. You go and they pull out all of the stops for you. Uh, all of the senior ministers meet you. I've met presidents. I've met the, the president of Colombia. I met the former president of Colombia. I met the minister for education in Russia that I was specifically sent out to meet. Uh, we're signing up students, some for Waterford here from Russia. Uh, we have, two t- I signed up 2,500 students from Japan. Uh, students coming into Ireland to study in Ireland is on the increase. That brings in about 1.9 billion 
a year into the Irish economy. Many students are bypassing Britain because of Brexit and coming to Ireland. Ireland was voted the safest country, um, uh, easy for integration, uh, institutes of technology and university is geographically well placed by a European barometer. So Ireland is doing very well and highly respected across the world and I love going out and representing my country. How do you feel that... Um you're not getting recognition for that. The same way John Deasy might feel he's not getting recognition for the work he's doing in the United States. Well, I, I kind of... Yeah, and he is doing good work. He, I, I know for a fact he is. Are you annoyed with the media? Sometimes, but I'm a politician. I'm annoyed with some of the media. And I, I was listening to... Uh, I, I listen to your programme as much as I can. And I think it was Elaine Fennelly was on during the week. She was talking about the negativity for Waterford. And, like, I can't understand this. I can't understand why we are... Uh, uh, so negative. Uh, but she like, was talking about the positivity, yeah. Yeah, but, and I mean, like, you take uh, uh, an example would be, uh, uh, I can only call him a coward, the guy that wrote, writes the Phoenix, who doesn't put his name to something, a political moron, who consistently runs down politicians. He's been picking on me for about 20 years. I laugh at it. And but, some of the points he makes, though, are very, very astute. Well, you he see, does some very good research, well, and he would be, and the newspaper would be, I'd say, very upset at you saying well they, they can be would. upset all they like but I mean if you look at because some because they of should have right to reply for that oh absolutely but like I mean you look at some of the headlines I mean like someone once said that um, you know good news stories don't sell papers and I, I'll give you a good example I remember I got slaughtered by the independent the national independent and the times when I announced that we'd got funding for Waterford Airport, they said this was gone bean politics at its worst. No planes flying in Waterford Airport. Sorry, they slaughtered me a year before that because I got emergency funding and I got the funding uh, that the all airports get. They had no plane fl- flying. I got a million one hundred thousand. They went berserk. I didn't see. Uh, they called me everything under the sun. You can read it back yourself. Uh, did, I didn't see um, uh, the News and Stars front page saying, we're standing up for John Halligan here. This is for Waterford. But what, what you did get was, you got other politicians from around the country, uh, or, what's his name, Senator O'Kadeen, who, who, who managed their Air Aaron, said, Waterford Airport is viable. It needs to survive. So, like, I have As, as I remember, the News and Star did some very good reports on the importance of this, and they were quite critical in certain reports about the Independent, critical of the other media. That's yeah, what look, I remember. Look, so, I, again, I, we can't be picky and choosing. No, but I, I, have the, I have this thing about self fulfilling prophecy that if you continue to run down our city, and don't say the good things. And maybe you should bring somebody in from the IDA. And there, I met the IDA. Well, at, the News and Star, Darren Skelton was the first one to break the story about the North Keys, right? Dermot did a lot of work in the Munster Express. Dermot Keyes is a good guy. They've done a lot. Yeah. Like, you may have personal issues with individual journalists. No, no, actually, it's, a, it's funny you should say that. It's like if I have a row with you, I'm never going to have a personal issue with you. You've taken me on a few times, and rightly so, and so is Billy before that, and Eamon before that, and like all politicians. But I do think, I do, I actually think, I met the IDA, and the IDA will tell you this, and maybe you should bring one of them in. And they will say, you know, companies all around the world do assessments before they come to a place. And they read the papers. They see what's happening locally. And sometimes they pick up all these bad vibes. Nothing's good's hap- nothing good's happening in Waterford. There's not stuff being presented in Waterford. And will the IDA think that they ha- do the IDA think that has an effect? They do. It's about time. Waterford is a really good city, a res- reasonably safe city, better than what it was. Not perfect, not as it should be, but a lot of good things are happening in Waterford. You would have been one of the people in opposition that would have raised yes. issues that needed to be done. Tom Murphy was in the other day saying we have to shout stop that there is a lot of work being done in the private sector, mm. but that the public bodies, including the government, haven't given enough. We're not going to go through all the list now. We'll go through it in a few weeks' time when we have you back in. Yeah. You yeah. talk about all no, the well, issues, I, talk I, about I, the cat lab, all that talk has. about yeah. the airport, yeah. talk about all those issues. Do you leave yourself open for well, ridicule I'm, by, for example, talking about going to meet the North Korean leader? That allows you to become... So Somebody that can be knocked maybe too easily. Okay, there's an interesting point you make. Like if you go back, like the cat lab has <laughs> it's such a, an issue as you know. But there is a second cat lab going to be built in Waterford. I have great respect for Martin Cullen. I know Martin well. Martin Cullen was not able to deliver, deliver the second cat lab for Waterford. He was not able to deliver the airport runway for Waterford. I delivered it. 
in this present government. Governments before me were not able to deliver. Sorry, Minister, now, it's, it's still not delivered. No, it's still it'll only be, planned. It'll and be what's del- the story with the airport? The airport, actually, it's very interesting with the airport. I spoke to the airport management yesterday. I hope it's more they're interesting. Inter- <laughs> yes, they're integrating the right now uh, the uh, people that have uh, invested money. Uh, they're talking to the landowners around thing. everything is fine with the airport the runway will be delivered in the airport when? Uh, I'd say everything will be sorted within about three or four months and planner permission will go in early next year and we'll have our runway there's no mark my words on this you'll be here even if I'm not in politics I can come in and you can bait me over the table there if the runway is not delivered for, the, the runway will be delivered for Waterford there are issues so many issues absolutely Absolutely. And you're saying that we should be talking about all the positive stuff, not the negative stuff. Look, we have a greenway here that is the envy of Europe. Yeah, and we've done that yeah, and loads of people and do I, it and he does nationwide stuff. There's the, loads of stuff. There was, a huge, of there was a huge big gap in that greenway and I remember the manager coming to me and saying, John, can we get this extra 1.3 million? I went in and met Pascal O'Donoghue with him. We got it. There's other stuff. I come and in the CatLab wasn't, deve- wasn't delivered by you, John. It was delivered by people. Power. No, no. I, 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 that's a reasonable point to make. It was it was delivered by people power and it was delivered helped delivered by all the other politicians in Waterford. Coming but together. I put it back on the agenda when I went into government. A second cat lab. We were years you can go back into the papers. And you said you'd resign and all that sort of stuff. Yes, but we have it. We have it. We'll well, have our second cat lab. Again. Well, you you know the the, the planning permission is going in, it'll start to be built. Uh, the beginning of next year. The second cat lab is a sure thing for Waterford. There's no question about that. The airport is a sure thing for Waterford. They're two big projects. Uh, jobs are going up in Waterford. Jobs are being created more than what they were before. It isn't perfect. Waterford is not perfect. I meet politicians from all over the country who say the same thing. We're being left down here in Tipperary. We're being left down here in Limerick. Everybody has a crib and rightly so. But let's talk about the good stuff that's happening in Waterford. Waterford is a fine, good City with and county. I, and county with fine politicians over the last number of years who've done their best to promote the city and county. John Halligan, we have to let you go because now you have to go to the hospital to, uh, to see Elaine. Thank you very much. We'll Thanks, ta- Damien. We'll talk we'll to talk you again, soon. again. Thank you. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremore. Now, welcome back. A lot and a lot of texts and comments about what we have been talking about this morning, both with Minister Pascal Donoghue and also with uh, John Halligan. We'll take you some of your, your calls and texts in a few minutes. Um, 083 975 and uh, call 0518461. Two, three. Firstly on the line is Bernadette Ryan. Good morning, Bernadette. Good morning, Damien. How are you? Wonderful, thank you. How are you keeping yourself? Very good, thanks. Yeah. How's your relationship, Bernadette? How's my relationship? <laughs> Up and down. <laughs> <laughs> because it's important sometimes have people have views and relationship counsellors have views about matters and they, they read the books and they know the theory and then their own personal life may affect what they say to people. I know you're not supposed to do that, but sometimes it does, doesn't it? Well, absolutely. And in fact, you know, one of the best things you can bring to the work of of counselling or psychotherapy is your own experiences and your own experiences that helped you to grow. You know, uh, and quite often, sometimes if a couple is in despair, I often will just say, well, of course, you know, I do have a perfect marriage. And that kind of breaks the ice a bit because they realise nobody does. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What's the point of marriage? What a amazing question. It is a very interesting question, isn't it? Yes, what's the point of marriage? And I think, you know, obviously there can be a lot of uh, misty-eyed and starry-eyed stuff around when people are thinking of getting married. It's a very exciting time, you know. And, of course, there's a lot of of, of happiness and sense of love and all of those and excitement and everything. But, you know, sometimes after, and a lot of that can also be focused on the big day and the wedding, and which is fine, but really marriage is is hopefully a a long-term commitment and, you know, quite often if people go into marriage expecting that their partner is now, they've now found the one who's going to make them happy, is going to fulfil them. And, you know, for a time that, that can happen, but it sort of, it can wane because it can be very exhausting trying to keep somebody happy all the time, you know. So really we are, we are responsible for our own happiness. And the point of marriage, I guess, is, you know, ideally two fairly contented, secure, grounded people come together to make something bigger. And marriage can be a great opportunity or any long-term commitment, uh, committed relationship for growth, for, for the growth of both parties and the couple. Yeah, d- d- 
the question I'd have for you, Bernadette, is, is there a difference between a long-term relationship and marriage? Hmm. Like, that sounds like such a simple question, but it brings up the whole social fabric, the whole issue of children and schools, the whole issue of uh, making a, a legally binding agreement yes, that yes. you can't walk, uh, walk out of willy-nilly if you're in a long-term relationship. Um, so is there a difference? There can be. There can be. It, it, it can depend on, I guess, the, the, the people involved, the, the, part, the couples involved, on their views on marriage. You know, um, some people see it as a, a legal, it is a legal contract and they don't see why they should have to do that and they don't need it. Um, some people kind of need the security of that because absolutely it is much more difficult to walk away from a legally binding committed relationship than a long-term one. Now that does not mean that long-term relationships don't work. It, it really depends on the two people involved and their reasons for getting married or not getting married. You know, it's not also a good idea just to get married just to feel secure. You know, one needs to feel secure in the relationship anyhow. But I think in terms of, it's, it's like one of those life passages, you know, um, marriage, it, every culture all over the world has a public uh, ritual for, for, for a couple to come along and say, we're pinning our hopes together, we're nailing our colours to the mast here, we're a couple. So there's something cultural about it, there's something archaic about it. it, it exists all over, it's a public statement, you know. So I think there might be a bit of a difference when it comes to that. And um, yeah. can, can I ask you, you're a professional relationship counsellor with many, many years experience, mm. do you find um, those that come to you, couples or individuals that come to you with problems in their relationships, um, for example, those that are married, is the majority of them at in the first five years, or is is there a, a, a you'd see a lot more that may have been married fifteen years, or what would be the the greatest tranche of people coming to you? Yeah, I suppose you know the the, the old famous old seven year itch kind of comes into it sometimes. You know, after around the seven year mark, when things don't seem to be the way that the the expectations were around them, you know, um, things can get a bit rocky for couples. And then I notice, you know, sort of I'm I'm noticing more and more people maybe you know who've been married quite some time, twenty five, maybe even thirty years. Um, coming in with that sense of dissatisfaction or feeling that, you know, it's, this, this marriage is going nowhere, I, I, you know, I sort of want to get out of it. And again, I think that's more to do with the individuals and their, their, their phase in life, you know. So sometimes it can be quite it can be quite convenient to blame the marriage or blame the partner. And this is where the potential for growth in a marriage is. You know, if we can continue to argue and we can continue to to try and be right or be wrong, and prove the other wrong. But actually, if we can stop and say, how might this help me to grow and expand? And within that, that's where, you know, particularly those who have been married long time, long term, it really is about inner growth. And can the marriage, you know, contain that? Can it hold that? Yeah. Some, sometimes what happens in a long term marriage or even after seven or eight or ten years one person wants to go, but the other doesn't. The other wants to keep things just as they are up through fear, you know. And so it's quite complex and complicated, but I, I do think that a marriage or a committed relationship can be one of our most valuable assets in life, to have somebody with us who supports us and who we support them and we're kind of in this together, which doesn't mean we're not going to argue. Of course we are, you know. Like, it, like the phrase you mentioned there, this marriage is going nowhere, that is a very flippant phrase and it's a phrase that can be used too easily by people because like where do you expect the marriage to go? Like well, yeah. you can grow, develop uh, personally and develop with a, a partner but the marriage isn't going to go anywhere like it's a marriage is a marriage isn't it? Well it, I, I guess hopefully the 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 dynamic in the marriage continues to evolve and it, you know Things change. Life phases change. There'll be a time, perhaps, particularly when there's children involved. Um, you know, there's young children. They take over, blah, blah. Then they're teenagers, and then they leave. And sometimes you find a couple looking at other going, what now? You know, and that's, a, that's, again, another big question, what now? So they can either, you know, I often say it's not about being totally dependent on another person, and it's not about being totally independent of another person, but it's kind of an interdependence. 
you know. Will you um, just pause for one second, Bernadette? Have a listen to Roy Keane talking about uh, John Walters. John Walters is a former Irish footballer. He was on television not so long ago and he was crying on television about um, problems in his relationships and with, with family and th- things like that. And just just a recounting thing. Oh. And Roy Keane um, gave a very hard-nosed assessment. Here's what Roy Keane had to say. Like a certain player scored against Holland. You live off that for the next 20, 30 years. <laughs> Listen, I know all about John Walters. I know all about him. <laughs> Bluffer. <laughs> Again, talks a good game. And then there's the circuit, of course. There's all the circuit stuff. Goes on the TV, how, how harshly he was treated by me. He's crying on the TV. Family situation. Uh, there's this, he's the only one who's... Don't do me a favour. <laughs> Not kicked the ball for Burnley for two or three years. I used to be driving the train, he'd be on the radio. You know what I mean? Why don't you lay low for a while? Lay low, take it easy. <laughs> Sorry, Look at his medals. Oh, that wouldn't take long, yeah. Um... I know Roy Keane can be flippant and all that sort of stuff, Bernadette. Um, this idea of criticising somebody else for showing their emotions, that can be very important in relationships, particularly with marriages, can't it? Absolutely, and I'd just suggest that Roy maybe stick to the football, but <laughs> not, not to go to the relationship <laughs> counselling business. <laughs> um, you could imagine Roy Keane as a relationship counsellor. That would be some crack, huh? Oh, God, I imagine him as a client, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no. I, I mean, I think particularly for men, um, you know, this old uh, stiff upper lip thing. Men don't show emotion and and all of that. So where, if they don't show the emotion, where does it go? You know, uh, quite often, you know, sort of a couple will come in and, uh, you know, the guy might say, "I don't, I don't have any feelings," or "I don't, I'm not comfortable with feelings." And and actually, everybody has emotions. Everybody has feelings. But for many men, they're kind of buried deeply, you know, and and can turn into depression. So yes, it is absolutely important uh, for people to be in for a couple, especially, to be able to express emotion. But it's not. It's not appropriate to blame the partner for those emotions. You know, you made me angry. You made me whatever. You know, the emotion belongs to ourselves. But yeah, in a in a in a healthy relationship where there's you know support, it's it's safe to express emotions. And then that's sometimes where couple do need help because if they've been married for together for a long time, and particularly the man maybe has been very. Uh, you know, sort of quiet and repressing his emotions. They may need some help with that because it's kind of it's kind of foreign territory, you know. But um, but most definitely it is, and I think more and more men are becoming aware of the the, the health damage they're doing to themselves by you know, swallowing down their emotions and not expressing them and, you know, yes. taking the hard line, you know. Bernadette, listen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. Good to talk to you again and we'll, talk, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Bernadette. Bernadette Ryan, relationship counsellor there, uh, talking about marriage and related matters. Back with more of your texts and comments. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. Many, many texts and comments coming in. Uh, John Halligan keeps saying, you have my word on this. Didn't he say that about 24-7 care? John's choice of words in these interviews is always interesting. It's a done deal. It's a fact. I know this will happen. We've been here before with John. It always seems to make things in statements, in hope rather than than in fact. John has put Waterford to his four in his political life, said this other text there. John's a genuine guy who always makes himself available to listen to the needs of his constituents. A big thank you to John for another texter for sorting out the bus run from Araglen to Fermoy. Others saying that John said he gives us the people of Waterford his word on the North Keys when it comes to money. He's given word on other things in the past and still hasn't delivered. Would you please wish John all the best in the future, whatever he decides to do in the next election. He's done Trojan work for Waterford. I wish him and Elaine well. I hope John will run in the next election, said this texter, wishing Elaine a speedy recovery. She is a wonderful lady. And we've a lot more texts and comments to read also uh, regarding the Minister Donoghue. John has texted in, this fella came down to sweet talk and plum also, but in truth gave no f- firm commitment or funding for projects. Tragically, people still vote for Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael we still vote for them 
A hundred years to get a second river crossing which bypassed the city says that all about our political waters. Um, coming up after the news at 11, Barry Kenny from Inroad Erin is coming into the studio. He is going to reveal the very latest regarding the talks on Inroad Erin and the North Keys. First, the news at 11 with Liz. Liz. Dacia Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to MulliganSpharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. Now it's one of those days it never rains but it pours. And uh, it's funny, we've got Barry Kenny in studio. We're going to be talking to Barry briefly. Barry is the press uh, officer. What's your full title, Barry? Corporate Communications Manager. Ah, oh, JD or, Mac. Know, Corporate Communications <laughs> uh, Manager, are. huh? Temporary Mudguard. Yeah. That's worth at least an extra 10 grand. <laughs> Auntie, I'd say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't make you blush there. But uh, press officer, we'll go with press officer. That's, that's what no we used to be known as. I know Barry a good few years. And um, just by chance, I rang Barry last night because of the issues regarding the North Keys. And Pascal Dunahoo was talking about it yesterday. And uh, effectively, I was saying we're in Rod Aaron blocking the North Keys development. So Barry, uh, just out of uh, chances in Waterford today. So he's, he's gladly come in to, to talk to me and I'll talk to you in a second, Barry. Just uh, Siobhan has texted in, can you please give the Oxfam charity shop on Georgia Street a plug today? We're having a two euro sale and a one euro sale tomorrow. It's the end of our spring summer lines and we stock many brand new items. That is from Siobhan. Absolutely, Siobhan. And well done to everybody. It does loads of great work in all the different charity shops around the city and the county. Frank has texted in, Roy Keane is a low life. The man has got no character. Uh, Nora has texted in, let's hope my prayer will be heard fully that the North Keys development won't go ahead with the Saudi Arabian money. We don't want to see it. Uh, human rights abuses, says Nora. But everybody else saying they want to see the North Keys going ahead. Damien, great interview with John Halligan this morning. I'd vote for him again at the drop of a hat if he decides to run. As he said, it's not perfect, but he puts Waterford first at every opportunity. Another texter saying, what planet is John Halligan on? He wants to come on the radio as a politician and with all the bad stuff that's happening and pending, because we don't have any real ministers here, he wants to talk about all the good things happening in Waterford. Get real. So uh, John Halligan has uh, divided opinion. Specifically, Barry Kenny, um, Pascal Donoghue spoke about discussions going on behind the scenes. What, in your knowledge, is Inrod Aaron's role in the North Keys development project? Well, obviously, there is to be relocated Plunkett Station as part of the project and that to be part of an integrated transport hub. So it means a far better station. It means better integration of public transport, better access to and from. And there's also land uh, involved as well. There's lands that we have that are required for the overall development. OK, let's just, yeah. let's just mention yeah. that now for a second. Sure. So you've just said that part of this, and some mm-hmm. people may not know this, yeah. it's important just to say, uh, say this, it would mean the physical relocation of Plunkett Station. Yeah. So as we know, Plunkett Station is on the far side of the river. Yes. And the far side of the main road. Yes. So that would literally mean taking the train and bringing it over to the North Keys development may only be around 500 metres. Mm-hmm. How big a, a deal is that? Like anything like that has complexities involved, but it's an engineering project, so it can be done. And we've been, I suppose, we've been working very closely with the city and county council on this from the off. And I would say, before I say anything, we support the project. We're cooperating with we're engaged with. In no way whatsoever are we putting any block on this project. Any engagement we've had, we've given the support and that's down to giving the details of the platform layout, the signalling requirements, so all that design work. Also, any site investigations that are required on our lands as part of the ongoing project has been facilitated all the way, continues to be. When I got your call last night, I was on to our project uh, uh, director who also was on to Waterford City County Council to say, is there something we're missing? And said, absolutely not. And you know, you've had a few people on today. You've had the Minister Donoghue, Minister Halligan, myself. We're all fronting up what we're saying. I don't know who is claiming that we're not being cooperative, but they sure as hell aren't saying it on the record to anybody. Is there some mischievousness going on, do you think? I don't know. It's I Look, I always say it's a victimless crime to give CIE a kick, right? OK. Um, and that, that's <laughs> probably been the case uh, for decades. But this is a great 
it's a great project for Watford. I mean, that goes without saying. And it is a great project for public transport in Watford as well. Because not only will it mean we'll have better facilities, more integrated facilities, it means that we, you know, right now, the location of the station isn't ideal in terms of access, in terms of connection. Uh, I always say, if I'm coming down the train to Watford, I'm told if it's dry, walk across the bridge, we'll connect it, we'll connect it the other side of the bridge because it's obviously a difficult access point there. So there's a lot of benefits uh, in terms of it uh, there. So we've, as I say, that is the engagement we've had. Obviously, there's, a, there's, there's funding that is being progressed by the project. It's private and through the Urban Region Development okay, Fund. Let's talk about the engagement. So yeah. you're fully engaged and yeah. have been for the last two years yeah. since, since whenever yeah. somebody got in touch with you first about mm-hmm. this. You've given the developers and the council your views about what can be physically done to make this happen. Yeah. And you believe it is possible to meet the completely. requirements completely. Yeah. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be in the plan if it wasn't. It's it, I mean we we're Part talking about plan. we're talking about two platforms there there's a signaling track layout. Oh that is a little bit complex. Obviously we have the expertise in terms of bringing it forward, but it's like it's not a particularly complex project in railway terms. Do you know how much it would cost to do the in-road air and aspect of things? Yeah, I think when isolating the in-road air and aspect from the overall there are Interchanges that there is inter development or sorry interconnection. Yeah, the road will have to be the whole raised thing. or lifted. Exactly. So, so, okay. Exactly. Okay. So I mean, but so you know, there isn't a kind of a this is the cost of the of the railway element because it is part of the wider development and there and and what you do with the railway develop, element impacts on other aspects. So, but ultimately, the funding mechanism, as we understand it, is through the uh, private developer and the council are seeking the Urban Reg- Regeneration Fund. OK, so has in Aaron been asked to pay a certain amount of money towards this project? No. No, we, we're, we have, we, that's not been the engagement because that's the, the model of funding and we haven't been asked for funding to uh, support the project. We've been asked for, as a, we have provided, because obviously it's in our interest to progress it, but we've provided the physical layouts, all the designs in terms of the actual lands, what's required. And we have then obviously worked with the development in terms of making sure access to our lands needed for the wider project uh, is available. In Road Air and comes under the auspices of the Department of Transport. Mm -hmm. If the Department of Transport, as part of this integrated development, had or is being asked to front up certain amounts of money, I presume you'd know about it. Well, they are, as I understand, they, they are the deciding um, agency in terms of the Urban Reg- Re- Regeneration Fund yes. uh, as far as this project goes. So, yeah, they are they are definitely uh, involved in it from that point. Because of view. they would say to you, we need in Road Aaron to allocate or to set aside 20 million, let's pick a figure out of the air, for this particular aspect. Like, have you any idea? Is there any ballpark figure for how much uh, year particular... As I say, don't, you know, to say this is yeah, but give a, us some. A, a, a wider a wider, a wider project. I don't, I don't like to pluck figures out, uh, out of the no, air. But no, no, no. But, but I mean, what I'm saying is... Your engineers yeah, have yes, some idea. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And what have they yes, said? Yeah, uh, look... Like, the figure yeah, that I was told was sure. between 18 and 20 million. Right, OK. I, I don't... I, that... To my knowledge, and I don't have the an exact figure in front of me, to my knowledge, that doesn't sound you know, completely a million miles away from, from what the overall uh, cost would be. But yeah. Somebody uh, said maybe even 24. So we'll, right. we'll say around 20 million, mm-hmm. OK? But you haven't been asked to put aside any money. No. No. Is it your understanding then that the private developers, in conjunction with the council stroke, the government, mm-hmm. will put this money up, whatever it costs will be done by them. But that's that that is the model. That's what was proposed that's from the, the outset. That was what was proposed from, from the outset uh, in terms of the development of this project. And when you hear Pascal Donoghue saying that there are ongoing discussions mm-hmm. behind the scenes about this, are you involved with any discussions at present? Well we engage directly with the city and county and, and county council. That's that's yeah. that's that's our engagement uh, on it. If at any point it was there there's there's input. We would obviously liaise with the Department of Transport because they are a parent department uh, both on this and, and on everything else. But I mean, the direct funding is, is something that has been progressed separately to ourselves. And you would have, I presume, put together your engineering plans mm-hmm. months ago. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Maybe absolutely. even a year yes, ago? Yeah. I, I, again, I, I don't have the exact yeah, but months that ago. Yeah. But there's been nothing since. 
Well, not that there's nothing. No, we're, we're engaging in an ongoing basis. You're engaging, but there's no, there's no development, no change in any sort of criteria well, ultimately, that you understand. No, we're, we, we have, uh, it, if like, it fits. It's, it's part of the wider uh, project. We've been looking at, obviously, what you do in terms of when the construction happens, how we uh, you know, ensure that we have continuity of service, both for passenger and freight services. That's very important because, obviously, we have, uh, we have freight uh, as well. So... That's where our focus has been. It's, it's basically the practicalities and the logistics of it. Because part of the plan says is Irish Rail is to grow tourism and train to, to Gaul, passengers to Galway level. So the developers are saying we have a plan for that to help them, including non-stop to Dublin, free travel for Brexit migrants, it says here, tongue in cheek, um, and different issues about growing the commuter aspect of things like Irish Rail you're busy at the minute busiest ever year this the last year was the next year this year will be again a yes. lot of people travelling on trains yeah. there's this move back to the trains mm. which is great so yeah, from a business perspective yeah. uh, the model is progressive yeah. and it's positive and even looking five ten years down the line that looks like it's going to get even better yeah and the station, the new station will actually facilitate this growth. Now, actually, what you need to do further up the line is it's more the, the line capacity between Waterford and Dublin. That's really where the yeah. further works will be required. But ultimately, this station will be one that will allow for that level of growth. Like we ultimately want to, we, we went hourly quite a few years ago on Dublin Cork. And it's transformative in terms of the level of, of demand that it generates. And we basically have a two hourly service on Dublin Waterford uh, at the moment. Ideally, you would like to get that up to the early to build uh, those kind of frequencies uh, and generate because that's time as well. You know, that's time saving. We're doing track renewal work, for example, on Dublin Cork to improve journey times. Obviously, in Dublin Kildare, that helps. We want to do more work between uh, near the city to have more track to allow the intercity trains and commuter trains to operate separately. So there's a huge amount of work going on at the moment. And every presentation, every engagement we have with government, with political parties, with political people of all persuasions, including independence, as, uh, as you had. Waterford North Keys is central to our plans. You're fully behind it. Absolutely. It's a, great, it's a great project for us, for customers and for the city. Because it may allow, if the growth happens and if the North Keys happens, yeah. if and when it happens, yeah. Yeah. it will allow you to say, OK, let's try an hourly service in yeah. Dublin. Will you, and also you're talking about the economic activity. Gives the people, and don't forget, you know, people need a reason to travel. And you know, what I mean, that's why we have infrastructure. It's because it's the driver. You know, it facilitates economic activity. So if you've got people living there, if you've got people working there, they will need to travel to and from it. And what we hope we're seeing now uh, on this project and on a wider basis as well is public transport being put to the forefront of these plans because that is the only sustainable way we deliver that connectivity. So finally, are you telling me you know nothing about any issues or problems? that are going on behind the scenes in relation to what Pascal Donoghue said this morning? No, as they were, we, as we do, we're very, very open in, in engaging with the different uh, agencies. I listen back to Pascal. I don't think Pascal said at all that, uh, that uh, uh, there, there, there was any issue at all. As I say, you know, the day you have somebody who's, who actually says to you... No, but if, if they say to you with a live mic... <laughs> That there's, there's an issue, we will certainly address any yeah. issue they may they claim. But nobody said yeah, that. Yeah, because I know, like you're not yeah. a, a political body as mm. such, and, and you're representing a, a state service, um, semi-state sector and semi-state mm. service. So you'd like to know if there was issues there that are being, yeah. in other words, hoisted on you that you don't yeah. know about. Yeah, I mean, because are they, I don't know. If, you know I mean, in in the wider, obviously, this, this is a huge project. There are a lot of uh, of moving parts. But, Maybe yeah. there's an issue in another part of it. And it's very easy, if there is, to deflect it to someone that simply isn't involved with that issue. Kick CIE. There you are now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Bishop Bren. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a picture and I'll give you a kick up the arse there in a second. <laughs> Barry Kenny, thanks very much. Thanks, Damien. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. Now, welcome back to the programme. John Halligan is far better than most of the Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil people who represented us in the past, says this person. Uh, another person, Ed, saying, telling us not to look for equalities that makes us look like we're whingers is not good. John Halligan um, needs to be a bit more honest about stuff, said something. Another says, I'd say one thing for Halligan, he likes to blow his own trumpet. Waffle, waffle, waffle. And other people saying that uh, John Halligan has done great work for them. Can you remind Deputy Halligan that Martin Cullen delivered the M9? 
another person we don't want the second CAD lab we want 24 hour 24 7 care what about the Garda station I think I have time to ask John about the Garda station I asked him about the airport uh, another person John Halligan's interview conclusively proves that there's no hope um, others people saying again that um, he is doing great work um, Damien, just listening to John Halligan there, I totally disagree with him that uh, talking about John DC being great for Waterford. So other people texting in. On the North Keys thing, I was trying to make sense of it in the last um, last 24 hours in particular, particularly after what Pascal who said yesterday and this idea that there's talks going on behind the scenes. And to me, it comes down to the very simple thing that if you've any project, somebody somewhere has to pay for it. That's the basis, I think, of where we're going on this. And I think that's the nub of the questions that should be asked of any politicians and where we're going on this. Somebody somewhere has to pay for it. At present, you have Falcon Developments saying they're going to put in 300 million. They want the government to put in a certain amount of money. There was talk that Falcon Developments at the start would help offset the costs of some of these infrastructural developments. But Falcon Developments want the government to commit and do these things. And then you have the issues in the past about governments supporting private projects. So you're changing infrastructure needs on the basis of a private development. And yet you have Falcon Developments saying that, for example, when is Ireland 2040 starting for Watford and the benefits of the North Keys, the airport, the UNIB budgeted for? These benefits would be more than 100 million. Yet the costs that the government are being asked to put in is a fraction of that. It's a time to ensure it's in budget and capital plan, say Falcon Developments. For example, they're saying that it's only a 70 to 80 metres relocation of the train station and it's an incomplete jigsaw if we don't have the train station moved. So it's their opinion that the train station has to move. As you heard, Barry Kenny has said, Inroad Air haven't been asked to pay any money towards that move. My understanding on the infrastructural developments, you're looking at maybe 20, 24 million with that. So the government is looking between the different departments and the secretary generals of each department about how to budget for this. So there must be talks going on behind the scenes. The problem is, if heads are not knocked together on this, if all the secretary generals of each department that are involved don't come down to Watford and see what's needed to be done and done relatively quickly, this whole thing could fall apart. So it is a jigsaw. But it needs to be driven. Somebody needs to drive it forward. And whoever that person's going to be needs to be able to say, we will pull it together and make this work. Because if not, we're going to be here in six months time and we're going to be scratching our heads saying, how did we lose out on that? Or why didn't we do this? And why didn't we do that? So somebody somewhere has to make this happen because somebody somewhere has to pay for it. With that in mind, in terms of political representation, Fine Gael met last night in Dungarvan. They had a big, big talk on their constituency meeting. I went along, I was in Lawless Hotel. Before the meeting, a number of councillors and former councillors and members were being brought in to meet Pascal Donoghue, to meet Willie Gleeson and to meet Tom Curran, the Secretary General of the party, to talk about the bullying allegations, if they had any experience of bullying in the party, but also if they wanted to run or what they thought about in the next general election. So the first person I spoke to just outside of Lawler's Hotel a couple of minutes, literally just 30 seconds after he had been inside to one of these meetings. The meetings last around 10 or 15 minutes before the general meeting started around half eight. This is what Declan Ducey had to say to me. As you know, Declan uh, was mayor of Waterford last year. Declan, how are you keeping? Very well, I mean, you're welcome to the Gavin and great to see you here and your congratulations on all your good work for the constituents, my constituents in West Waterford and your lovely programme. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Um, what's happening here tonight? There's a constituency meeting. Constituency meeting now they're down in Dublin, Pascal Dunham and the General Secretary, Tom Cullen, and our organiser, local organiser. Is that organiser, Willie Gleeson there, Gleeson, I just saw? Yeah, that's right, yes. And what are they doing? They're having meetings throughout the day with different party yeah, members. Yes, to, we went to uh, identify... Um, well, to try and put behind us the media slur we got in, um, last June over this, I um, uh, accused of being members of mobs and uh, bullies you, and, and not fit for purpose. When you say media slur, you're not blaming the media, No, though. but the information that the media were fed, which by 
an individual that wasn't, you know, we, we will name, name nameless, like which wasn't, wasn't helpful to us, us party members. Our supporters were very annoyed over us. Has it damaged the party? No, no, I wouldn't say no. so. No, no, I'd say if anything, it's after... Um, it's after gelling us back together and um, proving that them that, 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 uh, statements were unfounded. And yet, the perception would be that it has caused rancour and division and bitterness and yeah. divisiveness. Yeah, well, that would be that would have been there before it, but I'd say that cloud is lifting now, lifted now, that it was cleared up, and that there was no uh, there was no. Bullying or any any un, untoward by so any you, members. You've just been in at the meeting by, with the the gentleman in question yes. you've mentioned, and you told them that. What did you tell them? Well, that you know, we welcomed them down, and I I was disappointed that it took them so long to come, but uh, they informed me that they were um, waiting on a decision from Deputy DC. And the minute he made a decision, they arranged this meeting. So fair play to him. We appreciate that. Are you expecting uh, Deputy DC to be here tonight? I wouldn't think so. No. And it's onwards and upwards for Fine Gael. Onwards and Who would you like to see be the next candidate to go in as a running mate with Polly Coffey? You might be looking at him, Damien. You're ruling yourself in. I'm ruling myself in. Thank you, Declan Ducey. No bother. So you heard it there first. Declan Ducey has announced that he wants to become a running candidate, a running mate for Senator Pawdy Coffey in Fine Gael in Watford in the next general election. The situation is that Pawdy Coffey was put on the ticket and he is on the ticket to run as a candidate. Uh, you'll hear Paddy Coffey in a second. One of the other men who wants to run is uh, Damien Gagan. He is a councillor in Dungarvan. He secured uh, many votes in the local elections. And here is what Damien Gagan had to say to me. It's great to have the Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue, here in Dungarvan tonight. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. And uh, he's had a, a long day. He started off early this morning in Watford City, came to uh, Dungarvan this evening, and um, interesting meeting ahead. What are you expecting? I think it's important uh, that in the constituency here in Watford now that we begin to look forward, I have to say. Um, a decision has been made by the current TD that he's uh, stepping down at the next election. So it's time that uh, the association, the organisation here in Watford would um, start to look forward. And I think that's important that we move, that we do move forward. We uh, we need to stop focusing on personalities, and we need to start to focus on the issues that are important for the people of Watford. How would you define the past six months, in particular, for Fine Gael in Watford? Uh, it's been difficult. Um, been a lot of up, lot of upheaval, um, a lot of focus on the organisation here from uh, from the media, both locally, such as yourselves, and indeed from the national media as well. And I I think uh, with the announcement that um, John DC is no longer running. Uh, I think we can move forward. You're not blaming the media, are you? Oh God, no, not at all. I mean, uh, there's obviously an interesting story there, and uh, these, but these things happen in all um, political parties and all organisations. Uh, uh, it's just that it's supposed to be an interesting, uh, there's an interesting backstory there as well. You have given a, an interview with the gentleman inside regarding the bullying allegations. What have you told them? I was interviewed today regarding um, my intentions. Um, for the next general election. That's what we spoke about today. Um, I made my case. I believe I made it strongly. Um, I think it's important that we uh, finalise the ticket here for uh, Fine Gael and Watford as soon as possible, within a matter of uh, weeks, I would say, a couple of weeks maybe. And I think it's important that we move forward. I made my case. I made it quite clear to him that um, I was up for the fight, um, that uh, I do believe that I give the party the best chance of... uh, holding the Fine Gael seat. And was there any mention of the bullying allegations? Uh, there wasn't. There wasn't. Um, I believe that the party has made a, a finding there, um, which, I, which I welcome. So, uh, as that, I say, it's time to move forward. Which they, they can't be proven. The allegations can't be proven. They can't be proven, no. Um, Declan Ducey has just told me he's going to put his name forward. Yeah, there's a number of people have decided to put their name into the hat, into the ring, as it were. Did and, that disrupt uh, you with that... Uh, um, my job, difficulties. Uh, my job is to is to make the case for myself, and the reality is now it's up to the leadership of the party and the national executive to decide uh, who should be on the ticket. As I said, uh, I'm on the ground. I have a track record in local government, and I, I want to take it to the next level. Uh, I'm aware of the issues that are concerning people here in Watford. Right throughout the constituency of Watford, I have to say, it, right the way, all the way from Ferrybank to Knockinore, I'm always saying it. Watford is one constituency, and it's uh, it's something that I'm, I'm up for the fight. 
up for the fight. Another person who may well be up for the fight is Shawnee Power, councillor based around the Rathgormack area. Uh, again, got a lot of votes in his area. Very hard working. And um, Shawnee is also not ruling himself out. Shawnee Power, how are you? I'm good now, Damien. Thank you, sir. A constituency meeting tonight. Yeah. First meeting since um, John DC announced that he wasn't going to be running. What's your, your feeling about how, how things are at present? I look, things are good, look. I suppose, look, I, it's disappointing. In one way, see John stepping aside. Look, John has done a lot of work, I suppose, particularly here for, to know back West Washford and probably around the county, look, as well. And look, John has runs an absolutely brilliant office and I have to give Marie and Jamie credit for that, look, and they do really good work. And I can, they're going to be a huge loss, like if they go always with John Go, like, and that's what I've seen this point. But look, we have to move forward now and move on there, you know. So, look, look, so look, we would have. You, would you let your name go forward? <laughs> I've been asked to put my name forward uh, by. Uh, got a number of phone calls I suppose in the last couple of weeks asking me would I, would I be interested in running and ask, tell me I should run there any but look I, I don't know maybe if it was 20 years ago I might have considered ah, you're still it young you're still fit you're still yeah. healthy you might give it a go yeah, look, I, I don't know. Look, we'll see what comes see out what in happens. the meeting there now tonight. Or look, there's, there's plenty of good candidates around. Look, you have, have Liam Brazel, like, which would be brilliant. Yeah, you have Party Coffee. Look, we have Damien Gagan here and John Cummins, you know. And I don't know if any more ladder in. You have Lola as well down in the CC as well there. So, look, there, there's plenty around. You're, so look, you're, I, not, I, you're not ruling yourself out? Not, 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 not at, at the present. minute. Look, I, I'm giving a little bit of consideration, but probably, look, I, I, I still, you know, I'm, I'm chatting about it here and there, you know. Oh, and, and, uh, you're available, for, se- it. You're available mean, for selection as I'm they enjoying say. it I'm enjoying the crack on it and finally Shawnee how would you define or describe the the last six months for Fine Gael? I know there have been some good votes in the local elections here for yourselves but uh, in terms of the, the party has it been damaged by these bullying allegations yeah look I, I don't think so look I don't think they ever really got out of hand I, I, don't, I don't believe there's any bullying bullying any is what I could see look there was no bullying any there's no bullying at that last meeting look you have a little bit of aggro I suppose at meetings if that happens there's a lot of meetings I've been at from time to time and often there could have been GA meetings and IFA meetings and, and different meetings uh, look look people I are think passionate, yeah. Are, look, yeah passionate I suppose yeah look and things are not look I think the party is well united here in Watford look and you know I think look I think Fine Gael do well in the next election look and we're looking forward to that so I'm saying that and the reason a lot of these comments are important is that Fine Gael still remains the, the largest individual party in the constituency and obviously they had two seats in the constituency before. There's a possibility on the, the figures at present that they may only get one. They may decide to run one candidate to go with um, Paddy Coffee. They may decide to run two Uh, And these issues relating to that will affect directly the political and economic issues. For example, number of people texting in, Damien, the hospital and Garda barracks are more important than the North Keys, in my view. We also have a huge empty building in Ferrybank, which is a sin. There's no need for new shopping centres. We almost have an empty shopping centre in different parts. So we need to develop other aspects of things. Um, We also then have what other people have experienced in the past in terms of their experience with Fine Gael. You're going to hear about that in a second. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. Now, a lot of people still very animated about the topics we've been covering. What BS from Minister John Halligan this morning says Councillor Pat Fitzgerald, Sinn Féin Councillor. The fact is, most honourable local politicians can't bury their heads in the sand and pretend we live in a perfect world. They have to deal with the fallout on government decisions and that they decisions have on homelessness, lack of health care and many other problems. Constituents don't contact their local councillors to tell them good things. Damien on Roy Keane says Noel Halligan, this is a guy full of bitterness despite all his success. History will remember him as being a bitter little man, a failed manager wherever he went. The North Keys won't happen, says Barry. It's as simple as that. Damien, not sure if you passed through Dungarvan recently, but the traffic lights at Sexton Street and Abbeyside have been out of action for the past six days. There's also three pedestrian crossings at the location. I saw an elderly woman nervously trying to cross. It's an accident waiting to happen. Please, please, says Seamus, can you ask somebody in Dungarvan Council to try and do something about it? 
Another person has said that Roy Keane's comments were nasty and inconsiderate. Now, Lola O'Sullivan is a councillor down in Tremor. Would Lola O'Sullivan be interested in running for Fine Gael? How would you classify the state of the party at present locally? Has it been difficult the last few months? It's been very difficult. Uh, it's very hard when you're driving around Watford and you're listening to yourself on the radio discussing things that I'm not even aware that are going on at times. And mm-hmm. It's quite frustrating, to be honest. Declan Ducey says that, uh, obviously, everybody's been brought in individually just to have a little chat. You're going in for a little chat now. Yes. Just in terms of, I suppose, have you seen any bullying in the last few months, last few years? Are you asking about me personally or are you asking? I suppose, look, it would be, look, there was, uh, you know, it's no, uh, I suppose if you go back through uh, Billy McCarthy's files back in the day, uh, and I'm talking about a long, long time ago, that I would have had personal issues within the party, which in fairness by the party were dealt with very well and very fairly um, as far as I'm concerned. And um, if it hadn't been, I wouldn't still be with the party now. Uh, so I can't say enough about how fair and reasonable they were to me when uh, I had problems. Where does this leave the party now? Who do you think would be running as a running candidate for Senator Paddy Coffey? Will you go yourself? Uh, I don't know who the next candidate will be. Um, I have four children. I'm very happy with my life in Watford. I am very happy in Tremor. I could not possibly see myself moving uh, out of Tremor and living in Dublin. I, I'm not somebody who can do it half, so it's all or nothing for me. Well, if the circumstances were in such a way that you were cajoled or convinced that this would be the right thing to do, would you put yourself forward? Would you allow your name to go forward? There'd be a lot of considerations uh, that I would have to take into consideration, a lot, including my husband's opinion, my children's opinion, and I suppose my greater family's opinion as well which was which is difficult for me personally because um, my sister's in the Green Party we're in a different you know And if you didn't run who would you like to see go? I would support whoever the party puts forward ah, Come on no, honestly, I, I think but I do think the party have to draw a line in the sand in Is somebody from the West or the, the East? That's a decision for the party. And that's a decision for the individuals as well. Like, you know... So you're open to persuasion? I'm absolutely open to persuasion. And you're saying... You're saying the... um, You're saying the East or the City, but there are other people who've indicated that they're interested as well. Like who? Uh, Liam Brassel was on the paper stating that he was interested, so... You know, it's out there for anybody or maybe yourself or maybe there's somebody else who hasn't shown their cards yet. Uh, A texter has just texted in. Damien, is this programme repeated tonight? Yes, it's repeated at midnight every night. It's also on podcast just after we finish up. But it's repeated at midnight. And I know a lot of people in factories, especially in taxi, men and women listen to it. And thank you for all those that do listen. A special shout out to everybody in Cartamundi. You're doing a great job out there, everybody in Cartamundi. And um, special shout out to them. Now, one person who really does want to become a candidate for Fine Gael is Councillor John Cummins from Waterford City. Uh, well, the purpose of the meeting is a uh, constituency meeting of the Fine Gael constituency uh, here in Dungarvan. Uh, obviously, there'll be members from across the county that'll be here. Uh, I know the topic of the general election is obviously going to be on the agenda, um, and obviously it's open to any member to raise any any issue uh, from the floor. So I'm sure it'll be a well-attended meeting. It'll be a good meeting. There'll be a few things aired, and uh, hopefully over the next couple of weeks there will have... Uh, finality brought to the uh, situation in relation to who's going to be the on the general election ticket. You'd like to run for that. This is the first meeting, obviously, since John DC announced that he's, he's not going to be running. Um, how would you classify the last six months for Fine Gael and Waterford? Has it been difficult? Uh, well, any time that you're, you're fighting an election, it's always difficult. Uh, we obviously had the local elections. Uh, we, did, we did well. We could have done better. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're, every party obviously always faces uh, challenges. Uh, we certainly have them, uh, but we're, we're working through them. Uh, and an important part of that will be finalising the general election ticket 
ticket and whatever that uh, will be uh, and whoever it is that's on the ticket uh, I think it's very important that, that a finality is brought to it in the next couple of weeks You will be putting forward your name? I will, yes. Um, look, obviously, I, I'm to to meet with the General Secretary and, and uh, the Minister for Finance and Pol- Public Expenditure, Pascal Donoghue, uh, shortly in relation to that. I know uh, they've been meeting other prospective candidates uh, today. Obviously, I had a very good uh, day with the Minister in, in Watford City today, looking at the, the North Keys and housing projects and the Lie Half Road and the Greenway. Uh, so I, I've been talking to him already. Uh, but look, I look look forward to outlining my case and, and my plans and, and how I would like to represent the party uh, in the city, the wider city area and Tremor uh, going forward um, and obviously with a view to I think uh, having two candidates it probably would be the best strategy uh, on balance for the party so look, let's let's see but it won't be a decision of me, it will be a decision of them, I certainly hope it will be in my favour but if it's not uh, obviously I'm a, I'm a team person and I'll row in behind whoever the candidates are and support them to try and uh, get the best vote for Fine Gael. And my understanding is that it'll be the national executive that will decide who is going to be a running candidate for this man, Senator Paddy Coffey. How would you assess the state of the party at present locally? Well, look, as I said to you, um, how you assess a party is the strength of the vote that and the candidates that's returned. And in the last general election in this constituency in Waterford in 2016, and that might, people would say it's against the head, we achieved almost 29% of the vote here in Waterford with two candidates, myself and John Deasy. And that was well above the national average that Fine Gael secured anywhere else. And in the most recent local elections, again, we returned um, uh, the largest vote for any party in, in in, in the constituency of Waterford in all of the local elector, electoral areas when you take them together. Now there are weaknesses in, in, in that and we recognise that and that's what we have to address as a party. Um, there has been issues politically over the last number of years but they, a lot of those now have been resolved or are, are about to be resolved I would hope and that's what this meeting is about tonight. Um, there was a lot that, the, the bullying allegations have been rejected uh, and not proven? Yeah well as I said at the time when I was asked I refute any such allegations. I have never witnessed any such allegations and I'm a member of the Fine Gael party now with nearly 35 years I'm, I'm a public representative with 20 years of that time and uh, yes often as in politics there's hot and heavy debates but that is not bullying in my eyes and uh, um, I certainly hope that that would be clarified further even tonight uh, at this meeting uh, where we have the National Director of Elections who is our Minister for Finance and the General Secretary of Fine Gael Tom Corn, before us to listen to the members tonight and then we'll see where we take the party from there. What will you be recommending in terms of a running candidate or a running mate for you? Well, look, that's something I think the members will voice. I don't, I don't want to be influencing it one way or the other. I have my own uh, strategy and my own uh, campaign to run. Um, I was delighted to receive the vast majority of the support of the members of Fine Gael in the last election convention where three candidates went before it, two stood, and I won that with quite a handsome majority. Uh, and, and, and I'm honoured to represent the party and the members as a selected candidate having gone through convention. Now with the vacancy there, it is likely that the party will add one. They may look at two, I don't know, but if they look at two, they may look back to 2007 when the last time we ran three candidates, that split the vote and we weren't as successful. So a lot of things feed into this. Um, The party has a strong grassroots base. I know, and the party knows, we need to improve a lot of things in Waterford. I'm anxious to step up to the plate um, uh, and try to uh, lead the Fine Gael party here now as the candidate and get back into the Dáil. I have unfinished business in the Dáil. I want to do what's right for Waterford and I've always believed that being in a position of influence is the best way to achieve that and that's why I'm a member of Fine Gael that's why I want to create influence for Waterford within Fine Gael if they return to government the next time Finally, anything to say regarding John Deasy's departure? No, look I, I, I'm not going to be uh, hold any bitterness against anybody um, I'm not going to be a hypocrite either uh, I, I wish John well uh, he has given a lot of public service and I'll say no more than that And Paddy will say no more than that. Not going to hold any bitterness. And that is the end of that. John Deasy wasn't at the meeting last night. Uh, Fiona Dowd wasn't at the meeting last night. I don't know if Liam Brazel was there. Uh, I may have missed Liam if he got in there. And as you say, I spoke with Pascal Donoghue last night and he confirmed that the bullying allegations have been refuted and not proven. So that's now put to bed. 
and the decisions we made I believe in the next two weeks or so decide what's going to happen so a lot of toing and froing over the next weeks between Fine Gael uh, a lot of people texting in Damien tell Pat Fitzgerald that Sinn Féin's history in government is not great oh wait they didn't get into government they sit on the fence said this per- person Damien it's a councillor from the east or the west not a Waterford councillor division 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 says John and Lismore Damien or Fine Gael running 15 on the ticket to get one over the line they're, they're beginning to look like a crowd of clowns uh, other people say regarding John Halligan that it was all me mine and this from uh, John Halligan and some of the stuff he said was spoofing Michael says Far and Four Airport got 7.5 million the North Quay needs 6.3 it seems everywhere is considered before Waterford and that is a shame back with more of your texts and comments Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to MulliganSpharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremore. Now we've had such a busy programme we don't have time for the interview with Jason and Mary will bring that again. Damien, I just heard Declan Ducey say Pascal Dunne who didn't come to Waterford to discuss the fact that John Deasy would not be a candidate in the next election until they were informed by him of his intentions. Somebody must be sparing him with the truth because supposedly he said it to the Leo Varadkar last um, last March spending vast amounts of money on the North Keys while we have social housing tenants living in poor conditions and no cardio cover is not on says Jean Damien John Deasy should run in the general elections as an independent candidate that comes in from Anne that's the first time I've heard that Anne Damien I'd like to thank John Halligan and Mary Butler for sorting out the bus issues secondary school bus issues in Ballyduff Upper a lovely note there regarding the issues there, but also saying we'd be grateful if Mr. Halligan would agree to meet with us and discuss the same for next year. Now's the time for, to plan for next year and discuss possible avenues we can take. Very important there on that. Damien, great show. Thanks very much, Kieran. Your Tuesday morning show was repeated on Tuesday night on Monday. So there's a bit of a mix up there. Kieran, we will find out what the story is on that and make sure that it doesn't happen. Damien, how they got John DC out of the parties, we all know how, why. Tony Burke, the Waterford FC manager. Big, big batch tonight for Waterford FC and on Monday night against Dundalk. They're playing Hearts tonight in the RSC. We'd like everybody, anybody who's around, definitely to go to that to support Waterford FC. He's, here's Tony Burke, Waterford FC operations manager, talking to Matt Keane. Tony, an unusual match on Friday against uh, Hearts Coast. What's your opinion on it? Matt, I'll be honest with you, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a nice distraction from our league. God knows it's been a tough enough year. Uh, our form at the moment is great and um, I'm looking forward to seeing a different challenge for the lads I think it'll be a great opportunity for Alan to maybe possibly put out an experimental side try and show off some of our younger blues to, to a wider audience God knows they have the talent and it'll be nice to let it be seen uh, as far and wide as possible Yeah because they have a massive cup game against Dundalk of course on Monday and the under-19 team are absolutely flying at the moment yeah, the Dundalk game, I suppose, in fairness, Matt, would probably be our biggest game for a long, long time. I mean, these are the kind of clubs we've always dreamed about playing down here in the RSC. We've waited long enough now to get a decent cup game, and now it's a quarter final. So I think it's all guns blazing for Monday. And as you said yourself, the under 19s are terrifically at the, doing terrifically well at the moment. And uh, in fairness, I think Alan and the lads have turned it around a bit as well with recent performances. So all, all the action is pointing to Monday night, really. Uh, and I think it's going to be a great game of ball. Yeah, but even for the Harris game, uh, everybody is still buzzing, Tony, after what happened up in Cork. That was an incredible night on Monday night. Yeah, you know, you, you'd watch it, Matt, and, and listen to yourself on the radio describing it as well. It's fantastic to think like that. You know, you go a goal down, you come back, uh, the heart and soul was there. We played on till the last minute, nicked the game at the end. I mean, so often, Matt, in the past, we've lost games at the end of the thing, possibly by switching off a little bit early. But in fairness now, I said I think the attitude there is that... Uh, we keep going to the final whistle, Matt, and it's great. It's great. Mm. Delighted. So it's a great opportunity now on Friday and Monday for the people of the Warble City and County to come out and support the lads. Yeah, I think it's very important, Matt. You know, people are questioning the, the sense of having two cup games. Well, unfortunately, you know, because of the situation with Scotland, th- this was the this was the appropriate time to play them. It was the, the most useful time for them. Unfortunately, it came on a cup weekend for us. But look, you know, we are a Premier League team, Matt. We, we want to be big enough, so we're going to play two games and we're going to give it our best in both games. Tony, that's brilliant. That's amazing, Tony, right? 
Matt, thanks very much for that. Thank you, everybody, for your text and all your comments during the week. Thanks for all the compliments regarding us getting a national IMRO nomination. Uh, Mike has texted in, anybody who made allegations of bullying in Fine Gael and they haven't been proven, are they going to be, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, will there be anything done to them? I don't think so, Mike. I think it's all put to bed now. Other people texting in. We have a lovely, lovely night coming up tonight in Watford. Uh, WLR is 30 years old. 30 years young. We're going to be talking about that on Monday. Have a great weekend. Jeff is up next. Whatever you do for the weekend, have a safe and happy one.